Hello, I'm Annette Young and welcome to the 51% a show about women reshaping our world. In this special edition, we're taking a look at the last taboo when it comes to women's health, that being menstruation. Coming up, how ad agencies and public campaigns are forcing us to realise that periods are not a dirty matter. We also talk to Jennifer Weiss-Wolf, who's leading the charge in getting a more equitable menstrual policy in America and the women in Madagascar who are highlighting the health and economic costs of not having sanitary pads and tampons in poorer countries such as theirs. But first, many of us are somewhat uncomfortable in talking about menstruation. As a result, ads for sanitary products have been largely symbolic of this general unease by often missing the mark. Yet things are changing and taboos are being broken amid calls to get real about periods, as Rochelle harrison Pless reports. Unlike the fluff-filled pad, has liquid locking gel, and gel can't leak. Can for decades, blue liquid has been the default stand-in for menstrual blood in ads for feminine hygiene products. While we're used to seeing blood on our TV and movie screens, period blood was considered unacceptable or unpleasant to look at. However, advertising agencies are moving with the times. Gone are the blue liquids and the all-white outfits. But when companies try honesty, they spark an outcry. This Australian commercial received the highest number of complaints in the first half of 2014. Then I remembered I was wearing a pad that was bulging out of my leotard. And the photo is still hanging on Grand's lounge room wall. Plus, there's the so-called tampon tax, with menstrual products taxed as luxury goods. In the US, a whopping 40 states charge tax on sanitary pads and tampons. Then President Barack Obama even weighed in. I have to tell you, I have no idea why states would tax these as luxury items. I suspect it's because men were making the laws when those taxes were passed. Has anyone got a tampon? Meanwhile, in Australia, the government slapped a 10% price hike on menstrual products it deemed, quote, non-essential. So several Australian comedians decided to remind people that menstruating is a natural part of a woman's life, breaking taboos with their beats, rhymes, and flow. Now, Jennifer Weiss Wolf is a leading voice for equitable menstrual policy in America. She's partnered with policymakers across the nation to address the economics of menstruation, not to mention access. She's also the author of a book to be released later this year, Periods Gone Public, and now joins me from New York. Jennifer, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we just heard there uh, Australian comedians who are using humour to get the message across about breaking the taboo on menstruation. But why in the 21st century are so many of us still so coy about the topic? You know, it's kind of a crazy thing. It's It's been going on for as long as time. And uh, I think we're all in a very fortunate place right now that in the past two years, we've had everything from humor to policymaking to sort of rebellious activism really actually getting at this problem. The fact that we just don't talk about menstruation um, honestly, for no good reason, and it doesn't serve any of us. Now, you were instrumental in helping New York City make history last year with passage of the country's first laws to ensure access to menstrual products in public schools, shelters and prisons. What's been the public reaction? The public reaction to the access laws in New York City that have now been uh, replicated in many other cities and even introduced in other states in the United States has been actually just remarkable. Um, whereas, you know, given the sort of long history of stigma and marginalization of menstruation, you might have expected that there would have been kind of a, ooh, don't talk about that in public kind of reaction. Um, it was really just the opposite. I think the, um, the knowledge and the understanding that for low-income people, managing menstruation could be a challenge, quite frankly, is a revelation and something that people really see as a solvable problem. 
Then you have the cost issue, the push to end taxes on feminine hygiene products. How receptive are governments in America these days to rolling back the tax, especially given that you've got Donald Trump in power? It's true. We have the president of the United States that called out menstruation during the presidential campaign um, in a divisive, uh, negative way uh, back when he accused Megyn Kelly of bleeding out of her wherever. But the truth is the tampon tax in issue in particular, which is, you know, which is exploding around the world, not just here in the United States, has been extraordinarily successful in, in a very short amount of time. I mean, we sort of put the issue on the map here starting in 2016. And in the past two years, uh, 24 states have actually introduced legislation to eliminate that tax, and four have done away with it. Um, and I should add, almost all with bipartisan support. And there's not much in the United States that you can say has bipartisan support these days. Florida was the last tax, or the most recent state to uh, eliminate the tax uh, just this session a couple of weeks ago, and Republican Governor Scott uh, signed the bill. So I think that's actually a really uh, kind of incredible and important testament to how universal this, this matter is. Jennifer, we're going to come back to you because I now want to talk about how menstruation becomes even more of an issue in the developing world. One in three don't have access to clean and safe toilets, water or sanitary pads and tampons. And that has direct consequences in the areas of health, schooling and employment for millions of women across the globe. Gail Borgia reports on the women in Madagascar who are speaking out on the issue. Every month it's the same headache. When she's on her period, this mother of four has to leave work to change her sanitary towel and wash. She earns less than one euro fifty a day as a laundry woman and it's time off and lost wages she can ill afford. When I have my period I can't work and therefore my children don't eat. Imagine washing three times a day costs 15 cents without counting the soap. Disposable sanitary towels are expensive. So I have to wear two pairs of knickers and use a third pair as a towel. Mary Claudette is not alone. The country has no sanitation policy. Two-thirds of Malagasy women do not have access to the fundamental human right of safe and clean toilets. Imagine that you have your period and you have to change your sanitary pad. There's no toilet, there's no shower, so you have to go outside. Outside, people can see you. There's no dignity. In rural areas, some use leaves as sanitary towels and they don't move during the day during their periods for fear of leaking or smelling. Without toilets, women struggle to deal with their periods, a problem made worse by a reluctance to talk openly about what is for many a taboo subject. Millions of Malagasy women are uncertain about a normal bodily function. 25-year-old Irene created the Citizen Healthy Girls Project for abused or abandoned adolescent girls who've been placed in homes. The objective is to teach them about puberty and how to make washable pads for better menstrual hygiene. Young Malagasy girls are always isolated during their period because it's women's business. The other members of the family don't even talk about it. And biology lessons are really theoretical. They're taught things they don't even understand. The budget of the Ministry of Water is just 11 million euros. Ten times more is needed according to the minister. Since President Eyre was elected three years ago, there is still no national public sanitation strategy. Jennifer, we just saw there where there are many women who don't have access to tampons and pads and are being forced to make their own and girls are missing crucial days of their schooling. If, if you're wanting to boost female participation in your workforce, this is indeed a critical issue, isn't it? You know, if you want to actually have the most productive society possible, taking care of our women and girls is obviously a crucial part of that. And menstruation is a, a, you know, a factor of life that affects the women and girls for a good part of their lives. So absolutely, the answer is, is yes, most certainly. And the idea that we're allowing girls and women to miss this vital part of their education, um, the opportunity to contribute to the economy, is something we all should be concerned about. So how do you get governments in poorer nations to address this issue? 
governments in, in developing nations are actually addressing this issue. I mean, the, the United Nations has deemed this a human rights and public health uh, crisis. The, the government in Kenya, for example, has uh, already taken great steps to make menstrual products available to students, to uh, eliminate uh, extra taxes on these products. Um, governments in India are doing the same. It's not that it's not happening. It's just not happening fast enough. And there are also health issues with menstrual hygiene being linked to high rates of cervical cancer in India, for instance. So how do you get those who live in conservative cultures to recognise that it's a problem and also work in improving the situation for women? Well, you know, it's really a challenge. Um, you know, it's one thing for, for us as Westerners to come in and, and say what we think is the proper way to manage menstruation or to think about menstruation. But truly, you know, there are cultural and religious beliefs that uh, I think we all need to be respectful of. Um, so it's a challenge. And the intersection of poverty and religion and stigma and culture creates almost, you know, kind of a perfect storm. But the idea, again, that women and girls are being you know, are not able to meet their potential because of inability to effectively manage this, this very natural aspect of their lives is, is a problem really worth delving into. And it's a combination, obviously, of resources, of research, um, and of, you know, truly sort of collaborative uh, enterprise. This is a global undertaking. Menstruation matters to all of us. It has to. Jennifer Weisswolf, we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And that's it for now. And if you'd like to comment on what you've just seen, you can head to our Facebook page. That's France 24.51% or do send us a tweet at underscore 51%. Thanks for your feedback so far. And please do keep those comments coming in. So until our next show, bye for now.